It's Monday, it's 12.15 and we're live in Westminster. Joining me, Conservative MP Tom Hunt, Labour MP Kim Johnson, Conservative commentator Tim Montgomery and head of the left-wing think tank, the New Economics Foundation, Miata Fambule. Today... <laughs> These are the scenes today after unvaccinated tennis star Novak Djokovic wins a court battle to stay in Australia. Can Michael Gove solve the cladding crisis? Everyone uh, uh, in the development and in the construction product manufacturing sector who has a responsibility steps up to the plate. Unfortunately, it does feel like another announcement that is a half-baked and doesn't go far enough to solve this crisis. Ministers say the UK can lead the world out of the pandemic. I'm certainly uh, confident that we are on a path towards transitioning this thing from pandemic to endemic. We'll speak to one of the defendants cleared of illegally removing the statue of Edward Colston. Let's start with the case of Novak Djokovic in Australia. Uh, the world number one tennis star has won his appeal to stay there after his visa was revoked by the government. We can show you pictures of his fans celebrating uh, that decision. There they are, uh, obviously filming as the judge delivered his ruling. Uh, fans there obviously think Novak Djokovic is in that car that you can see. Um, we don't know uh, if he was in the car. He's been held uh, up until this point at an immigration centre since flying into Melbourne uh, last week to compete in the Australian Open and defend his title. Um, he is unvaccinated uh, but had had an exemption certificate uh, to the rule that requires all travellers to Australia be fully vaccinated on the basis he'd recently had COVID. Um, let's hear what the Prime Minister Boris Johnson had to say. All I would say about, uh, about Novak uh, Djokovic against whom I played tennis, by the way, he's, he's pretty good, um, uh, is, you know, I believe in vaccination. And uh, I, I think it's... That was Boris Johnson saying he believes in vaccination. Uh, Tom, this is all happening, the Novak Djokovic uh, case, uh, in a country that's had some of the harshest coronavirus restrictions in the world. What message does the case send about vaccinations? I mean, what a mess, the whole thing. I mean, I, I, I don't understand what's happened here. I mean, clearly, if he had an exemption... And that was agreed before he travelled to Australia, and that should have been respected. But I understand that it may, it may not have been, so there's some confusion there. I mean, I think that um, Novak um, Djokovic you know, should be vaccinated. Um, I'd be interested to know his reasons for not being vaccinated. Um, but at the same time, I, I, I don't always agree with Australia's approach to COVID. I think they've gone over the top generally with how they've handled COVID. Uh, but I, I guess, you know, tennis is one in a sense, because the world's best tennis player gets to play and potentially win his 10th Australian Open, I think it would be. He wins. But no, I have to say, I'm, it's, a, it's a confusing one, but I don't really understand how it's been such a mess. Right, there is a furore, no doubt, uh, Kim, about what's happened. Tom is right about that. But does it say something more about vaccinations? Will people who agree with Novak Djokovic um, and they're anti-vaccinations in principle, will they take heart from this? I think um, there might be some people who might take that position, Joe. But we look at the same situation here. You know, um, people in this country, you know, adhere to the rules and procedures that they were asked to. You know, get vaccinated, um, stay at home, and but. Then they see what the Tory government did in terms of parties and stuff. And so that could um, evoke a reaction in terms of people not getting vaccinated. So, And I agree, the whole situation in terms of um, Novak Djokovic is um, a, a very um, fluid one at the moment because we don't know, do we, what's going to happen in terms of the position, in terms of the visa? Because there has been some suggestion that Minister might still try to... Yeah, on you know, new grounds. He could have to revoke grounds, the visa yes. again. I mean, broadly... Tim, in terms of the court of public opinion, um, initially there was, it seemed, a lot of anger in Australia about the exemption for Novak Djokovic. But as time has gone on, um, do you think public opinion is shifting um, to perhaps be more supportive? I mean, we saw those fans celebrating um, outside or supporters of his stance on vaccination. Do you think it's changing? 
I think there is a bit of a mood of change in our in Australia, and I I think they're just consternation really at the same shambles that we've been seeing. I'm I'm tempted to wonder if England's you know Ashes team have been running Australia's immigration system, but <laughs> I think you know it won't be the last time on this very program, Joe. And it often happens is that we talk about entanglements between oh. politicians and the courts, and this is yet another one. And I think we under uh, state as people who follow politics and examine, you know, how thing, how decisions are made in all of the major democracies of the world, how increasingly powerful the courts are. And I think it's a, a reminder to all of us to think more about how we govern these relationships between these two incredibly powerful institutions of modern democracies. Right. Well, in terms of that, let's pick up on what uh, Tim was saying, Miata, and actually just show everybody the headline here in the Daily Telegraph and perhaps the sort of repercussions, if you like, here. Premier League stars who refuse COVID vaccine could be barred from playing matches. Nadine Doris, the Culture Secretary, moves in to tackle exemption, allowing sports stars to be treated differently to the public. This is mainly football stars, UK ones, returning uh, here, have had exemptions. What, what do you think? Well, so I think there should be one set of consistent rules and they should apply to everyone. And for me, I think there are two different issues here. There's one, the question of vaccination. And I think everyone should be encouraged to, vac to be vaccinated. Um, and I think he should be vaccinated, quite frankly. But then there's the second question is about the rules. And in the end, I think the rules need to be applied consistently. Now, if there are legitimate grounds for exemptions and those exemptions would apply to anyone, then I think that's absolutely fine. Now, in this case, I think the, law the judge has made the decision that the exemption should be upheld. In fact, it was the Australian government that didn't follow due process. And I think that's absolutely fine. But one rule cannot apply to one person and a different set of rules to all of us. We apply the same rules consistently. And at the heart of it has to be public health. And the only question that matters is, is the rule there in order to protect public health? And if it is, then it should be applied consistently. Right. Well, on the issue of public health, you'll have heard uh, perhaps yesterday, we'll show you the headline in the Daily Mail, the Education Secretary Nadeem Zahawi, um, saying that he hoped that the uh, UK would be able to teach the world to live with COVID, uh, looking at plans of doing so by March. Um, is he right, Tom, this idea that the UK would lead on going from a pandemic to an endemic when we've just passed the grim milestone of 150,000 deaths of people uh, with COVID? You know, I think it's important to realise you've been living in this nightmare for 21 months um, and, and, you know, the restrictions have been used and to, to, to stop the spread of the virus, but they've had quite devastating impacts on people's lives, uh, livelihoods and liberties. Um, I think we've actually seen, um, I think, the Prime Minister be vindicated um, for not introducing more restrictions over a festive period. We've actually seen case numbers in Wales and Scotland higher than England, even though they introduced additional restrictions. You know, And I think that we've got to get to this moment where once and for all, we permanently rule out these kinds of measures. Right. I mean, do you agree with that, Kim? I mean, has the Prime Minister been vindicated? Um, we had Wales's First Minister, Mark Drakeford, saying that actually England is the global outlier in terms of its approach on fighting Omicron, although, broadly speaking, Labour has been supportive of Boris Johnson's case for light-touch restrictions. No, I don't believe that um, Boris can be vindicated. No, at the very beginning, we were very slow in terms of locking down. We had major issues of PPE. And if we think about moving from the pandemic to an endemic, we've got major issues at the moment in terms of staffing shortages, where, you know, there's a, a major um, resource issue in terms of the NHS. It's struggling at the moment, you know. But that as a result of years of austerity, you know, this isn't just about um, the global pandemic. We have suffered um, at the hands of the Tories for 12 years and under-resourcing our public sector and our public services, John. Oh, I think we put record sums of money into the NHS. It's what, you know, the Labour Party voted against our plan to raise money to put into the NHS. But in terms of us being an outlier, well, so, you know, so be it. At the end of the day, that shouldn't matter. What matters is, was it the right thing to do or was it not the right thing to do? And I think the data quite clearly shows that the approach in England was the correct course of action. I mean, what has been the benefit of Wales and Scotland going down the route they've gone? Because right. actually, COVID cases are higher, economic harm up, mental health problems up. You know, what is the benefit in their approach? I, I think you're exaggerating because, let's be honest, the level of restrictions that were put in place in Wales and Scotland weren't particularly dr draconian. It's uh, We don't know yet is the answer. S say that we, if you're a pub owner. We don't know yet if, if, if our approach here is the right one. In the end, we're going to have to live with COVID. Of course we're going to have to live with COVID because it's going to be here for many years. But for me, what does that mean is the question we should be asking ourselves. 
it does mean that you've got to have a basic level of protection at home. That is face mask wearing in crowded places like public transport. That will mean a testing regime that's fit for purpose. That will mean an va annual vaccine programme. But it also means trying to grip the pandemic globally. Because until we solve the pandemic globally, we will not solve COVID at home. And that does mean rich countries funding a glo global vaccine programme. And it also means the UK government and other governments stopping the, at the moment, they are blocking the waiver of patents so that we can produce it en masse in countries so that we get everyone vaccinated. Until we do that, we will not be able to live with COVID because there will always be variants that will set us back. Tim? Well, I certainly agree. We seem to have a debate in Britain at the moment about um, vaccinating ever younger people ever more often. And I agree, really. I think the biggest failure of during the whole COVID e uh, epidemic, really, has been the advanced rich Western world to share the vaccine with poorer nations. We aren't or safe from COVID until everyone mm. is safe. And all governments have made mistakes. I get slightly fed up with the sort of Kim Johnson routine of everything the government does, they attack. Look, every government in the world has made mistakes during this crisis. It's been an unprecedented challenge. Overall, I think the government's got the balance right. But certainly I agree on vaccinating the poorest people in the world We've done far too little. Kim, do you want to respond to the, the, the point about... Well, I'll go back to the point um, that I said at the beginning in terms of the government was very slow in terms of locking down. We look at what happened to the care sector and our care homes. It was very slow. And as Joe's pointed out, 150,000 people have died, have died in this country because of some of those abject failures of this government. Tim? I, do, I just think that... Uh, I'm sure the Labour Party doesn't want any advice from me, but... Every time you hear a Labour spokesperson at the moment, they just take a political partisan line, attacking the government at every opportunity. I don't actually think that's where the British people are. They know the seriousness of the COVID epidemic and they would have liked to have seen a lot more constructive opposition. Praise where the government has done things right, like on the vaccine programme, like on some of the other medical innovations that this government has sponsored. I'd have to Overall, disagree with government you. government has done well. I'd have to disagree because the government has been supported by Keir right throughout this pandemic. Right. I mean, it, it is true, isn't it, Tim, that Keir Starmer has said that he would support on things like the, the, the vaccine and where progress has been made. But, Kim, interestingly, do you think that actually Keir Starmer should have taken a tougher stance in opposing the government when it comes to restrictions? Because, broadly speaking, as I say, they, he, he, he's supportive of it. He has been supportive. And you will and know... Well, you will know that um, the vote at the end of last year in terms of mandatory um, vaccinations, there was um, a backbone result and, you know, some Labour politicians voted, you know, to oppose that. So I think, you know, um, I this think... This NHS often care. Yeah, 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 and I think, yes, from... I personally think that there should have been some stronger opposition I, to some things. I have absolutely no doubt if there had been a Labour government, we would have introduced restrictions like they've done in Wales. I think that's quite clear from a public statement, as we were seeing at the time, from, from frontline Labour politicians. Although it's not what Keir Starmer has actually um, said thus I, far. I think if you look at the statements that are being made at the, the crunch point, I, in my, well, my view is, without hesitation, the Labour Party would have gone down the Welsh route if they'd been in power here. We have to deal with what we've got at the moment. That's um, hypothetical at the moment, oh, um, what you're talking about. I think it's quite clear if you look at the statements, that's mm -hmm. what would have happened. No. All right, let's talk about uh, the cladding crisis, which has been ongoing, as you know, for several years. Um, we're expecting an important announcement from the Housing Secretary, Michael Gove, about leaseholders caught up in that uh, crisis. Newsnight's uh, Lewis Goodall, my colleague, broke the story uh, at the end of last week. He's with us now. Um, Lewis, what will he say, Michael Gove? Well, Joe, Michael Gove is going to, uh, as we were reporting on Friday, put developers on notice. He's going to use very bellicose language. He's going to say that he is going to come after them if they are not willing vol voluntarily to come to the table and negotiate a settlement for historic building defects, which are legion uh, across the country. Now, this is an interesting change of tone uh, from the government, at least. Up to now, and I think this is the most important thing of all, up to now, the government had said that up buildings only over 18 and a half metres would be guaranteed that all of the people in those buildings would not have to pay anything for the removal of their dangerous cladding. Michael Gove, the important thing about what Michael Gove is doing now is making a rhetorical break with that and saying that not only will buildings over 11 metres, also the leaseholders in those buildings, not have to pay for their cladding removal, but is also effectively saying that in principle leaseholders shouldn't have to pay anything either for 
their cladding or indeed for the suite, the array of other building defects, whether it's poor insulation or whether it's inadequate fire breaks, all the things that either were against regulations at the time or certainly where the regulation could have been better, that they won't have to cover that either. So it's an important, at the very least, rhetorical break mm. with what's come before. I think leaseholders, although there's a lot of devil, there's always the cliche, devil yeah. is in the detail, I think leaseholders are going to be pleased about it. Well, it's interesting you use the word rhetorical in terms of the break uh, that you have outlined, because in October last year, on this programme, the former Housing Secretary, Robert Jenrick, blamed the Treasury for preventing him taking the action he wanted to. Let's have a listen. I'm obviously able to speak a bit more freely now than I was just a few months ago. The choice for the government is what is the balance between the state paying and then trying to recoup as much of that as possible from the developers through taxes and the leaseholder. The leaseholders well, obviously find that extremely unfair, right, well, but the I... only way to fix that would be for the taxpayer to step in and massively increase that £5 billion fund. At the moment, and I've been, you know, I, was, I fought this battle for a couple of years, the Treasury, the government is simply not willing to do that. Uh, so, Lewis, what's changed? Well, in one sense, Joe, I don't think anything has changed. The only thing that's different is that you saw uh, Robert Jenrick there effectively outlining option A and option B. I think what Michael Gove is doing is trying to come up with an option C, in the sense that, um, as was shown from the letter that uh, was leaked to me on Friday, mm. you can see that the Treasury has still maintained its position that no new public money will be put forward to deal with this problem. So, therefore, Michael Gove had a decision either to continue with the loan scheme in which leaseholders would have to pay or, as he is now trying to do, to extract more money from developers. I think this is Michael Gove effectively trying to come up with a different position. He's effectively got much of the same position that Robert Jenrick had, but is trying to weave and duck and weave his way to a slightly different outcome than we might have expected them from what Robert Jenrick was saying there. But the, the base position is still the same, in the sense that that letter was clear from Simon Clark, the Chief Secretary of the Treasury, mm. to Michael Gove, the Housing Secretary. It said that if you are unable to extract the money from the developers, then you will not be able to You'll be able to threaten a tax, but it's very clear that that is ultimately will remain uh, a decision for the Treasury. But if you're not able to extract the full four billion from uh, the developers, then the money will have to come from existing departmental budgets. And of course, that raises the prospect of either levelling up money going to pay for this mm. or housing budgets going to pay for this. So we may end up in a situation where fewer homes are built in order to pay for the historic backlog of uh, defects. And as I say, the Treasury are very clear in that letter where they say, if that is the case, you must prioritise safety over supply, which is, I think, for a government with a housing target of 300,000 new homes alert a year, potentially a very significant change. Uh, Lewis Goodall, thank you very much. We're going to have more details, of course, this afternoon uh, when Michael Gove is in Parliament. Um, let's discuss uh, reaction to the court case of the Colston Four. Uh, we're going to show you some pictures. I just have to warn you, there are flashing images. Um, there they are. This was after they were cleared of criminal damage by Bristol Crown Court. Uh, supporters and the press outside that court. Um, they were cleared uh, after toppling the statue of Edward Colston, the 17th century uh, slave trader and industrialist. Uh, we're joined by one of them, Rianne Graham, uh, one of the Colston. Well, welcome to you, Rianne. Um, just before um, you speak, I just want to read you what the Attorney General, Suella Braverman, has said in response, her political reaction, if you like. There are tweets here. In them, she says, trial by jury is an important guardian of liberty and must not be undermined. However, the decision in the Colston statute case is causing confusion. Without affecting the result of this case, as Attorney General, I'm able to refer matters to the Court of Appeal so that senior judges have the opportunity to clarify the law for future cases. I am carefully considering whether to do so. Um, what's your reaction to that? Um, well, I think it's important with this case to understand the case law that it relied upon. Um, and that's that's the case of Ziegler, which was um, five people that lay down outside the Excel Centre for um, an arms fair. And they were initially found not guilty, then by the High Court that it got uh, reversed to guilty. And then the Supreme Court eventually reversed it again to uh, find them not guilty. And... Um, Basically, this is where our human rights and criminal law intersect. This isn't, people keep calling it a loophole, that they're, we're going to close the loophole. This isn't a loophole. This is where, yeah, our human rights and criminal law, whether it be damage or obstructing the highway or whatever, where that intersects. But it's important also to know that 
um, out of the Ziegler case, uh, the Supreme Court specifically said that this would, it can never be a green light in that case for obstructing the highway, in our case for criminal damage, particularly of statues, uh, because everything is on a case by case basis and needs a, an analysis of fact. All right, but 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 in general, um, what do you think of what Suella Braverman is actually saying as Attorney General? Do you think it's fair that she is going to at least look at this? I mean, I suppose with the um, the divided opinions out there, she probably has a duty to um, look into it. I don't think she'll get anywhere with it because we have followed the rule of law and it is just that the jury has sat through all of that evidence and decided that we acted accordingly and proportionately within the bounds of our human rights. Right. Well, on the basis of the rule of law, again, I'm going to show um, some pictures of the toppling of the statue because do you accept, Rianne, that for many people looking at these pictures that there is a disconnect between you being acquitted of criminal damage and then seeing you, uh, as a number of others, did topple and roll a statue, uh, as we can see now, along the road. I think we've just got to bring it back to the reason why 10,000 people were in the streets that day. It's this, this overt frustration with inequality and police brutality, you know, seeing people murdered on, um, you know, on live on television. It's, it's not OK. And more locally, it's about the frustration of people like the Merchant Ventures, this society that has existed for around 500 years, in fact, maybe 700 years, actually, um, <laughs> who still have so much power and authority in the city and are unelected. Mm. Um, I think, you know, there's a very specific time when the, uh, the Colston statue came down. People were frustrated with, the, uh, with COVID and the pandemic and consistently seeing government officials uh, enforcing laws, but not following them themselves. All right. Well, and then, yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, just stay with us because we'll get some reaction. Just on listening to what Rianne has said, it's very clear uh, where she does that. She says it's a very specific statue in a specific place at a specific time. Uh, and that's what made this case different. Um, I think it's a disgrace. Um, I think you've had, you've had um, some individuals who have committed criminal damage. They've broken the law. There are legal and democratic processes available to make the case for, for, for certain statutes going. Those yeah, routes have been shut. But the shunned. jury said they hadn't. They those, were acquitted. Th those routes have been shut. So in essence, you've had individuals who have committed criminal damage who have got away with no punishment. Uh, that hang is, on. That they is were a cleared. Problem. They were cleared a by a jury so, under the existing so, current system here um, yeah. that said they should be acquitted and they were acquitted. Something quite wrong has happened. And, and I think it's important that we learn from this because at the end of the day, it's a job of the jury to decide guilty, not guilty, not to get into a debate. How do you about know they have not to get into a to debate? The evidence and not come to, to that view. Um, what the debate? You are literally the, 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 making the debate, conjecture the debate, based on the debate, no evidence. The debate. A historian coming into a trial. To, Edward Colston was not on trial. They were on trial for committing criminal damage. It is not the job of a jury to get involved in a debate about their political motives, whether they're virtuous or not. It, did they commit they did cr criminal damage? How yes do, or no? How do you know they did that? So that's why it's been looked at the Attorney General. Okay? How do you know the vast that majority they did of people on? in this country think this is Answer an absolute disgrace. How do you know the jury did that? How do you know the jury did look at the evidence? Everything I've seen, everything I've seen and read about this case causes me great concern, and it's right that the Attorney General looks at it, and that's what she's doing. That's what she's doing. Well, well, well let's pick up on this issue of Suella Braverman looking at it. Does that worry you? Well, listen, we've got a jury system for a reason. For everything we know, the jury has looked at the evidence, has adjudicated she's on not that looking, evidence. She's not looking at the case, she's no, made that very clear. Uh, but the jury has come to a verdict. Now, if there is legal grounds, and the Attorney General finds clear legal grounds in order to uh, push forward appeal, that's fine. But if she's doing it simply because she does not like the verdict, that is absolutely well, hang on. wrong. Uh, we're not talking about an appeal. Uh, we are talking about, or at least Suella Braverman is talking about looking at the law in terms of guidance for any future, potentially, any future cases. Well, look, it, in the end, we've got a jury system, the jury looked at the evidence and it came and they came to view. And for me, we should respect that. And, you know, the thing I get frustrated by is that it is all well and good for the government to be putting so much energy into a statue. Quite frankly, I think the government ought to be putting its energy into looking at the question of structural racism, looking at the fact that half of black families live in poverty and putting its energy into trying to solve that problem rather than creating a factious problem around 
around a statue um, when there has been a judicial system where the jury has looked yeah. at the evidence and has come to the view, and we ought to respect that. We ought to move on, and yeah. we ought to be dealing with the root um, cause so, problem. So, so actually, we've had... I'll go back to the basics. We've had a group of individuals who have taken matters into their own hand, who have broken the law and committed criminal damage, and they haven't been punished. You know, Ultimately, they, that is a problem here. And, and, and also, we talk that about precedent. That is not what the we jury talk, decided. Yeah, and to be, to be fair, be I've, let, jury, you, I've Tom, let you talk yeah. extensively. Could you, please, jury, could, you please stop inter right. could you please stop interrupting I, but, but, me? Because I'm not I getting know, an opportunity I, to speak. I, I I've been interrupted now by two say, different people. You say that they've broken the law, but you do accept that the jury acquitted them on the charge that they were in front of them for. They, they committed criminal damage. They committed now, criminal damage, of and they broke the law, really and they and they haven't they, they haven't been and, and actually and talk about precedent, oh. talk about precedent. I know that a good number oh. of um, you know um, people such as yourselves would probably like to see the Churchill statue in the Thames. You know, actually, I'm incredibly Again, concerned. Sorry. Conjecture. Well, let me get would you, because that Kim, was would you like to see that, the Churchill statue in the Thames? I have nothing against Churchill. And the reason that that statue was pulled down was because um, people had asked for that statue to re be removed. It had been this stood there for Cook. 125 years. The man was responsible for employ um, enslaving 85,000 African... Why couldn't they go legal processes? Yeah, Why they tried they that, right, they well, tried well, that let, and didn't get nowhere. Case, let's get back to the case of hand. Rianne, of course, I'm going to come back to you in just a moment because there's lots mm -hmm. that's been said. But first, First of all, Tim, your view on not just what has happened, but the idea that it might set a precedent that there has been political reaction to what is the verdict of a jury? We should respect juries. Of course we should. But sometimes juries get things wrong or you know, the law has been interpreted badly by a Supreme Court and they've been told what the Supreme Court's view is on it, for example. Um, O.J. Simpson, I'll just put that name out there as you know, okay. a, an illustration perhaps of what I'm talking about. I fundamentally oppose abortion. It's a really controversial view, I know, but I regard the destruction of unborn life as the human rights disaster of our time. Am I now allowed to go to an abortion clinic and disrupt it and you know, have conduct criminal violence? Of course, that's not how we operate. And the, you know, the defendant has just said, we tried and tried in Bristol to get the uh, statue removed and they didn't listen to us. But you wait, we are in a democracy. Just because they haven't listened to you or appear not to have listened to you, you don't then go and do what you wanted to do anyway. We are very fortunate in this country to live in a democracy and we must let democratic processes take their, their path. And All so right. I, I think the government should use every... Oh. Avenue they have available to revisit this decision. All right, we'll come back to that in a minute. But, Rianne, what's, uh, what's your response to what you've heard from uh, Tim and Tom? Well, I think uh, what he's just saying about uh, democracy, you know, um, our right to a jury trial, our human rights of freedom of expression, freedom to assembly, are all very much cornerstones of our democracy. But I will say that um, I'm not sure uh, the voice of the lady that was speaking before who, who that is, but... Um, it was really illuminating the fact that in the, the police crime and sentencing bill that there's now going to be a change in the uh, maximum sentence for if you pull down a statue and yet no changes to um, protecting uh, black people or, um, you know, moving towards equality. It's do very you, illuminating as to where people's priorities what, stand. Do you think what you've done will set a precedent? Do you think it's going to be a green light, Rianne, to others to do the same thing or similar? Well, it, it can't set a legal precedent. Anybody else that goes down, goes to pull down a statue or damage anything based on whatever intentions they have will be held to account to the law as we were. Um, I mean, it's already inspired people to do things, you know, to take statues down, I suppose, in the in the US mainly. But I think we've really got to look at the, the cause of this and not the actions that All are right. being taken. Where so, does this come from? Tom? So there's this debate here about precedent and there's two different things. I think there's sort of big P legal precedent and there's small P small p precedent because but, Rianne is right but, about but, 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 yeah, 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 but there's, there's a distinction here ultimately if i was a um an activist who was considering you know taking taking matters into my own hands committing criminal damage i would have been encouraged by last week's verdict if if they'd been properly punished i would have been less likely to do this sort of thing but this verdict being let off in a very high profile way i'd be much more likely to do it so in that sense absolutely that set a precedent uh Rianne? 
I mean, <laughs> like I said, those people, if they do take the, those matters into their own hands, will be held to account by the law, as yeah. we were. And we, are, we have not been found to be criminal, and our actions were found to be proportionate to the situation we found ourselves in, and they found it not to be proportionate to convict us. So we... Yeah. <laughs> so we have agreement. The thing, the thing I struggle with, Tom, I don't understand why you're so cross. We do have a system, right? They were charged. They've gone through the criminal justice system. A jury has looked at the evidence and has come to a verdict. Just because you don't like it is no reason to say the whole thing doesn't... It's not like they weren't charged. It's not like they haven't gone through the process. They have. Mm. And the jury has come to view. We have a judicial system. We have right. a jury system that has endured for so, hundreds of years. So, so why am I angry? There's probably two reasons. Firstly... Um, because, you know, like millions of people in the country, I've seen what I've seen on the, on the video, I've seen the, the criminal damage, and I've also seen four individuals, you know, not get punished for that. So that's the first reason. The second reason I'm concerned, you know, and I've been accused of not being a supporter of the jury system. I am. And it's precisely because of that that I have such grave concerns about what's happened here. I think I've seen the, ju the jury system be politicalised. Uh, I think it, and, and, and it causes me great concern. You should not have historians going into a trial talking about every cause. Edward Colston wasn't on trial. He wasn't on trial. There are democratic and legal processes for those who want to take down his statue. But and they tried to. And, and, it didn't, and, it did, and it didn't work, Kim, yeah, because people have got different views yeah. about statues. But can I just you say know, that? And, as, and, and, as a, and as a yeah. sort of Catholic Irish um, per person, you know, I, I, of part Irish descent, you know, I see the Oliver Cromwell statue every day, and he did great, but terrible things against Irish Catholic people. But I don't see that as today's society look, holding Oliver Cromwell up as being this great man. He's a significant man, whether I like it or not, and there's a statue. But I appreciate it's a different debate about statues. You know, but we, we should have that debate and go through a legal democratic I'm process, a black not MP commit criminal damage. From Liverpool, you know, the wealth of our city was built. Uh, on the back of the transatlantic slave trade. And in 2000, my city council gave an unreserved apology for the role it played in the slave trade. We have the, the only international slavery museum. And as, as um, Rihanna pointed out, the reason that people were on the street because the death of George Floyd shone a very bright so light on race equality. You so, know, so that is Bristol about council people you know, rising up yeah. and challenging racial and social injustice. Tim? What oh. happened, of course, to George Floyd last year was outrageous. Um, but the big underreported um, consequences of the unrest that we saw um, on America's streets last year is an unprecedented crime wave in America. It's barely reported in Britain, but one of the consequences is a former cop has just become New York's mayor. Mm. What those protests um, resulted in was many criminals across America thought the police were no longer in charge of the streets. And all sorts of property and other crimes have exploded across America as a result of those protests and the failure of law enforcement agencies to properly respond to them. Yes, there is a right to protest, of course there is. But when the public and criminals see the protests become ugly and then nothing done about it, we're on a dark path, and that's why I'm worried about the verdict that we had last week. Uh, and Miata, just to bring up that the, the Bristol Mayor Marvin Rees has said that the toppling of the statue was less significant than people have suggested, will have little bearing on the fight against inequality. Um, I think he also says that the actions of Rianne and uh, the co-defendants was performance activism, as he put it. Look, for, for me, we have spent a lot of time talking about statues rather than talking about the issue, which is structural racism, which is the fact that we have, you know, black and, um, um, and uh, other ethnic minorities people that are hugely underrepresented in many sectors that are living in poverty. We have big endemic problems and we're not dealing with those as long as we're getting distracted by other things. So I'd much rather this whole debate was about how do we deal with structural racism? How do we ensure that people, in respect of their colour, have life chances so that they can succeed and have op opportunity on equal terms, rather than statues? And every time, you know, your government decides to make a political issue, which I think it is about cultural wars and all that nonsense, they are distracting from the fact that they should be dealing with the matter at this, hand. This is about a rule of law. The people who engage in a cultural war were the individuals who took down that statue it's not us. We believe in the rule of law. Of course, there's Where a Where is the government's of, of course, strategy of, of, on equality? I'm, I'm just going to try and get there. Of course, 
uh, you know, tackling racism and inequality is vitally important. But that doesn't yeah, mean that doesn't mean I'm, I'm sorry, somebody's interrupting. Yeah, so, right. so, somebody's right. interrupting. Yeah, sorry. Uh, OK, okay. Oh, she's interrupting. I thought you'd I, I, sorry, she's still interrupting. Before. Sorry. Sorry. Um, um, but, but but actually, no, of course, you know, tackling uh, racism and, and inequality, which um, some of my constituents still suffer, uh, is incredibly important. But that doesn't mean it doesn't give you a license to carry out criminal damage. And in terms of what Kim was saying, you know, I think a lot of the things that Liverpool Council seem to have done make sense. But all of that's legal and definitely how about you do that in Bristol? How about you focus on that, not committing criminal damage? All right, I'm going to give Rianne the last word before we end this. Rianne? Sorry, I, was, I just I wasn't, didn't mean to interrupt then, but I just find it interesting that uh, the rule of law point when we have politicians such as Robert Jenrick, who is, you know, the West Ferry Printworks development unlawfully give, handing over millions of pounds. We have Pretty Patel, oh, our okay. Home Secretary, okay. who went on holiday well, to Israel, you know. All right. It's... Well, Rianne, those are broader. We will and, and we will discuss those issues when uh, the time is right. But Rianne Graham, thank you very much uh, for joining us for this thank discussion. Um, I just want to show everybody uh, this article article in the Telegraph, the headline, um, a revolt on the right is brewing and I'm ready to be part of it. That is Nigel Farage, former leader of uh, UKIP. The Tories haven't noticed yet, he says, but a UKIP-style surge of discontent is building in the Red Wall. Now, he's currently, Nigel Farage, the non-executive president of Reform UK and argues that voters in the so-called uh, Red Wall seats are disillusioned with Boris Johnson and the Conservatives because of issues that we've discussed on this programme, channel crossing, the Brexit deal, climate change policies and the cost of living. He says Reform UK will benefit from that, as UKIP did over the last decade. Now, we don't have uh, specific polling for those seats. Uh, the latest national poll um, from YouGov uh, today puts Reform on 5%, one point uh, behind the Greens. But Nigel Farage does claim that they are doing much better in certain red wall seats. How credible is this revolt on the right, uh, Tim, that Nigel is talking about, Nigel Farage? Well, I don't think it's going to go anywhere particularly because unlike with, you know, the Brexit, the EU issue, I don't think they have a clear rallying point, an issue that people really can understand and say that matters enough to me to support Nigel Farage or UKIP or, or whatever again. But I think Nigel Farage is right that um, they, there is an awful lot of disaffection amongst Conservative um, voters. This government doesn't really have coherence. Um, it faces a very weak opposition, I think, and so it still has every chance of winning the next election. But that isn't the most important question for me. The most important question is, you don't get parliamentary majorities like this very often, the, this kind of scale. We should be using it as Conservatives to reform the country in significant ways, address the major challenges. And this government isn't. It's wasting and squandering these years of power. And I just encourage people like Tom, you know, press this government harder to do bold things. I still don't, for example, know what levelling up is. It's the, the lack of intellectual seriousness of this Conservative government, and I say this as a Conservative, is the most depressing thing about it. Right, well, uh, Tom, you, you're agreeing. Uh, you're sort of nodding away. Uh, <laughs> well, with, I, I, with your, I, he's I, got I, it wrong, Boris Johnson. No. He needs to change. Um, I mean, I think there is a certain degree of discontent. Uh, amongst many Conservative voters. And I think if you, you mentioned the Channel Crossings, you know, that is a key issue for uh, Conservative voters. You know, they voted to take back, many of them voted to take back control of our borders. I mean, they see uh, what they're seeing on the TV screens in terms of uh, illegal immigrants coming here and being able to stay here. That doesn't make them very happy. So we've got a borders bill going through Parliament at the moment. That really does need to deliver. And I think on climate change, I think that there really aren't many people in the country who don't believe that climate change isn't important. But I think there's, when it really starts to hurt people in terms of their bills, you know, I think we've got to find a way of balancing that. We've got to tackle climate change, but we can't be doing it on the backs of a working poor. Right. I mean, we need to be looking at um, the cost of living crisis that we're dealing with at the moment, isn't it? You know, we've got um, Conservatives in 80 Red Wall seats who will be worried at the moment in terms of the reaction from the electorate in those constituencies. You know, higher um, energy crisis, um, prices, you know, there it will we, be, we, we, you know, an impact on those already ultimately. affected, you know. And again, yeah. I will talk about the impact of 11 years of austerity, bedroom tax, you know, the um, taking away of the universal credit to, to, uplift. All of these things are having a greatest, significant we, impact we, 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 on the most deprived in our community. Well, and this government we, needs to be looking at what they're going to do to support we, those we, communities. With the greatest respect in the world, I think I have a slightly better understanding for Conservative-leaning voters in red wall seats. And I think really what they need 
is a Conservative government that is absolutely rigidly focused on their concerns and their priorities. And that needs to be cost of living, immigration, law and order, making a success of Brexit, getting the economy going, moving beyond COVID. And I think the Prime Minister is more than capable of doing that. Um, I think he's more than capable of doing that. Right. He needs to do it. And why not Keir Starmer? Is Keir Starmer capable of winning back uh, those voters, of winning back those red wall seats for the Labour Party? Or is this a battle that is going on, on, on the sort of right of the political spectrum? No, I think that, you know, Keir Starmer does have an opportunity to win back those seats. Joe, we're looking at, you know, the poll at the moment, you know, um, um, Kia has come out with, you know, a policy agenda. We're looking at the moment, you know, uh, a will windfall tax on oil and gas producers to help and support those that are going to be suffering the most during this um, energy crisis. Right. I mean, are they going to be the natural beneficiaries or is there a risk that the uh, red wall voters don't come back to Labour? Look, I think that there's always a risk, but in the end, you know, a lot of people lent the Conservative Party their vote, they lent Boris Johnson their vote, and they will judge the government on its record. And if there's dissatisfaction, I don't think it's right or left. I think it's the fact that the government has been chaotic and shambolic. I think it, Tim is right that actually on the core issues that matter to people, their living standards, public services, Brexit, which was supposed to be this thing that was going to deliver so much for the country, the government's record is pretty poor. They are not delivering on the core things that people care about. And then you add in a uh, number 10 that seems to be mired in sleaze, a number 10 that doesn't follow the rules, and people are pretty ticked off, and I think they're right to be ticked off. And yeah. I think it's for the yeah. government to respond yeah. and for the opposition yeah. to yeah. show no, that it's look, a government in waiting. Look, there's no point in me, you know, sitting here and saying that, you know, various things would be far worse under Labour. I mean, I think they would be. I think in Keir Starmer, you have somebody who is the architect of their Brexit policy, which was to block Brexit, to not respect democracy. Mm -hmm. You have somebody who believes essentially in open borders, free movement. So on, on so many issues with a key to red wall voters, Keir Starmer is not on their side. But does Boris Johnson need to change course? I mean, even Lord Frost, I, I, who has resigned, think, said we need to I think change we, direction. I think we need to be free mindful. markets, free debate and free taxes. Well, I, mean, no I, taxes. I, I, don't, free. I, I don't disagree with any of those three points. That. But, you know, but ultimately, when you're midterm in a parliamentary cycle, you're going to have choppy waters. There's some choppy waters at the moment, but I still think Boris Johnson's the right captain to see the uh, ship through the choppy waters. All right, enough of that yeah. metaphor. No, no. Enough of that metaphor. Let's just show um, you this, Kim. Uh, oh, Tim, did you want to say something quickly? I just, I just want to say, Tom, really, lots of governments have midterm problems because most governments do important, unpopular reforms at the start of the parliament, and by the end of the parliament, they start to show their results. The problem with this government is that it hasn't done those big reforms. You know, it should have been fracking, for example, getting shale gas out of... The land, it's a more environmentally friendly source of energy. But not many of those... We I aren't just... taking big decisions. I, That's the I, look, I, have, I have some sympathy with the point you just raised, but to be fair, not many of those past governments have had a global pandemic on the scale of COVID to have to deal with in the yeah. first 20 months. So and that's the difficulty of being yes, government. You have to do more than one thing at a time. It is. I, yeah. but if, if, if oh, what, multitasking? Did, uh, have, yeah. <laughs> All right. Just before we go, the Daily Telegraph has this story. Jeremy Corbyn, uh, former leader of the Labour Party, could establish own party as hopes fade of him being reinstated as Labour MP. He is looking to upgrade his charity, the report says, and run under its banner at the next election. Now, we asked Jeremy Corbyn's team if this is true. Um, they did. Um, they haven't actually got back um, just yet. But what do you make of the report? Well, it's the first I've heard of it, Joe. you know, and what I would say was that as a party, what we need to be is united in terms of taking this government to account and looking at winning seats at the next election because unity is key and crucial in terms of going forward. Right, I've been told they haven't got any plans at the moment. That doesn't mean it might not happen uh, forming a political party. Would you welcome it, Kim? I think, you know, I'm a member of the Labour Party and it's about um, collective responsibility. And it is about being united and, as I say, taking um, this government to task about this dreadful way that they've dealt with the crises. They were, you know, they, they rid um, um, a wave of um, optimism during um, the beginning of the, um, the COVID crisis, you know, but now the popularity right. seems to be waning. That's all we've got time for. Thank you to all of my guests for a very interesting programme. I will be back tomorrow, of course, with Politics Live at 12 15. Bye.